At first sight, you'd say it's a very simple business, simply to, to look at the records and see how much we've found, how much we've produced, how much we've discovered, and extrapolate those trends out into the future. And uh, at first sight, it seems easy. Surely everybody can do this. But as you begin to look into the question, you find just a maze of conflicting information, um, politics, economics, financial factors enter into what people report. And I might expand a little bit on that because it's kind of the heart of the matter in a way. That, um, well, first of all, there's a question of the first question to decide is what we're measuring. And there are many different categories of oil. It's oil is not just oil. There's oil, nor ordinary oil that has been the dominant supply so far. But in addition, there's deep water oil, there's oil from the tar sands of Canada, polar oil if they find much of it up there, gas liquids. There's a lot of different categories and each behaves differently. It has its own costs, characteristics, depletion rates, techno technological needs and so on. So the first step in this analysis is to be very, very clear about what we're trying to measure. And that's not easy because the statistics don't make the distinction that well. And different databases have different and often undefined uh, boundaries between the different categories. Anyway, so that's the first step. Um, then the next question is the issue of reserves. Reserves is how much is left in an oil field. And really, in a technical sense, there's no particular difficulty in making a reasonable estimate fairly early in the life of a, of a field. But in practice, what was reported uh, was subject to very strict stock exchange rules, and quite rightly so. These rules were designed early in the United States to stop fraudulent exaggeration in, in, in that environment. And so the rules were the rules did, uh, stopped you claiming more than you had, but they didn't have any problem with claiming less than you had. And the oil companies, the international oil companies, were subject to these rules, and they found it very pragmatically reasonable and, and commercially good sense in every way simply to report as much as they needed to report to meet their financial objectives. There was nothing wrong with this. There was no trick or conspiracy or anything else. This was just good normal management. And that gave them a kind of stock in their back pocket that they could use if they had a setback around the world or whatever. It just made eminent good sense. And those days, frankly, are coming to an end because the most scope for under-reporting is in the giant fields and they're getting old, maturing, so there's not much scope to under-report anymore. But that under-reporting gave a very misleading impression because the reserves tend to grow over time simply because they reported more each year. Nothing had changed, in fact. And that gave a sort of comforting but extremely misleading image of steady growth. So from the, the oil company standpoint, or the data from the oil companies, one's got to take this factor into account. And you've certainly got to backdate any revision that is reported to the original discovery to get a discovery trend. Then on the other major distortion in all of this is OPEC. And uh, in the mid-80s, OPEC uh, had its quota system to reduce production to raise price. And the quota was set in part on re reserves you reported. Well, uh, th that was established. And then in 1985, I think it was, Kuwait overnight jumped from 64 to 90 billion barrels reported reserves. Nothing had changed in the oil fields. This was simply to increase their quota, to allow them to produce more, to make more money. And um, this was, uh, this was uh, it of course irritated the other OPEC countries and they didn't quite know what to do. And then a couple of years later, Kuwait announced a small increase from 90 to 92, which perhaps was a genuine one. Maybe they found a small field or increased the reserves or something, and that just blew the fuse for the other lads. And Abu Dhabi said, well, if you are 92, so are we, up from 31. Iran looked down its nose and said, Abu Dhabi, we're certainly bigger than you. 93, up from 47. And Iraq capped them both at 100, up from 49, I think it was. And then Saudi was in a problem because it was already reporting more than Kuwait. 
so it couldn't match Kuwait. So it dithered for another couple of years and then made a massive increase from, I think, 170 to 258 or something. And Venezuela, over its side of the Atlantic, it jumped from 20, 25 to 56, I think, to match this other increases. And in that case, it did so by including all this heavy oil that had not been counted before. So you have 300 billion barrels or so included in this confused reporting. Now, it's quite possible that the early numbers were a bit conservative, um, inherited from the private companies when they were involved. So some increase might be valid, but there is no validity in the numbers themselves. It's just one person copying another, you know. So it's an awful job to try to unravel all of this, and I've been trying to do it for many years now. Um, uh, there are industry databases, and it, it happens that I was asked to make a study on, on um, the main industry database back in 1995, when this thing was properly constructed with sort of informal links with the oil companies and so on. So I and a, and a French colleague of mine uh, were asked to make a study of, on the basis of that, which we did. And um, since when I've tried to update it every year as well as I can with such information I can get from every different source. And it's, you know, you have to be more or less a detective to try to unravel all of this confusion and see try to spot the anomalies and try to fix them as well as you can. One can say with absolute assurance that the numbers are wrong. The better question is by how much, and I think we're getting fairly close to a realistic uh, estimate.